Hey, good morning to everyone. So for some of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Rohit Bardasani and I am a full-time instructor with INE and I have five CCI, CCI and route switch, security, voice, collaboration and service provider. So <clears throat> this webinar is mainly going to talk about the basics of dot one X, 802.1 X and uh, MAB. So, so let's quickly get started. If you do have questions after the webinar, you can always email me or um, send me a tweet or connect me on LinkedIn. <clears throat> so what exactly are you going to be learning in this webinar? Basically, we would spend a few minutes on dot uh, one X intro and then MAB intro, basically the differences between dot one X and MAB. When should you use dot one X and when should you use MAB? We would also be configuring, basically I would do a live demonstration of um, uh, configuring the switch and connecting it to ICE for authentication so that we can authenticate our endpoints using dot one X. And I would also show you map. So basically for dot one X, I would use a Windows PC to authenticate. And for map as an endpoint, I would use an IP phone. <clears throat> so let's have a quick overview of what exactly is map and what exactly is dot one X. See, the thing is that um, as you all know that security plays a really important role um, in any uh, any company it, it's it's the main fun the main function is to to ensure that only authenticated users or authenticated devices connect to your infrastructure now you have a firewall a firewall main job is to protect you from outside people coming in but what about protecting your infrastructure within the organization? So device logins can be, can be authenticated through um, a AAA server like ICE or um, like a TAC hacks or a RADIUS server. It could be an open device or it could be ICE. So you could do a device-based login, but what about port-based authentication? So without you doing any kind of authentication for the port, what's going to happen? Like imagine an employee just connects a device or maybe he connects like an access point uh, to a switch and maybe he wants to give access to internet access to a lot of people, maybe his colleagues or something. That could be kind of categorized as rogue devices in your organization and you really don't want that. So there obviously has to be some kind of mechanism where instead of doing a device-based login or device-based authentication, we, we somehow do a port-based authentication. So when somebody connects to a port, the port does not give you direct access because without doing any kind of authentication, what's going to happen? Let's say if I connect my laptop to a switch on maybe port number one, what's going to happen? If that port belongs to, let's say, VLAN 100, I would go into VLAN 100. I would get an IP address from that VLAN and I would get access to whatever the access list defines. So basically I get access. There is no protection um, for any employee to actually connect to a switch. That's where MAB and dot one X really comes in. Now, <clears throat> both dot one X and MAB, they're pretty much the same thing. They're pretty much the same thing. The, they both do port-based authentication with one difference. With, with dot one X, the switch would ask you the endpoint for a username password, which means your endpoint needs to have the supplicant. So you could have like a Windows inbuilt supplicant. Windows has an inbuilt supplicant or you could use any connect for authentication. So the switch is going to ask you, hey, you are trying to connect to this port. And before I give you access, you need to provide me with the username password. Once you provide the username password, 
that username password is taken by the switch and sent to ICE for authentication. And once the ICE authenticates, responds back with maybe access accept and hey, he is an authenticated user. He is indeed an employee. So he gets access to the infrastructure. He goes into the VLAN, he gets an IP address. He maybe gets a DACL from ICE. Maybe uh, he gets a security group tag. So it all depends on how you configure your eyes. But the whole point is in dot one X, you, the switch is asking you for credentials with Mab. Mab is again, pretty similar to dot one X with one difference. Instead of the switch asking you for credentials, it is going to take the first packet that comes for you from you, uh, which is from the end host or the end device. And he takes the MAC address as the source or as the username and sends that to ICE for authentication. It's still a port based authentication, but the only time you would want to use MAB is when you have devices connected, which don't really support dot one X. I mean, Nowadays, most devices do support dot one X, but if you look at, let's say some old printer or maybe a fax machine, I really don't know who uses a fax machine, but it's still around maybe in some companies, but yeah, I mean, if you have an old printer or a fax machine and they don't really support dot one X, then you can do Mab for them. So the only difference is in Mab, the switch is not going to ask you for credentials instead he would send you a message saying, hey, send me, a, send me one packet. And that packet is sent, it could be a layer two packet, it could be a layer three packet, but he takes the MAC address from that packet. He drops all of the frames and takes that MAC address as the username and sends that to ICE. Both dot one X and MAB, they both are uh, port-based authentication. So it kind of gives you an additional layer of security. Obviously you can do a lot more with, uh, you don't really need to do just DACL. There's a lot more that you can do with ICE. Obviously in, in a short time of this webinar, I would not be able to cover that, but talking about just the basics, it, they both are port-based authentication. So coming back to uh, this uh, slide, so MAB, which is MAC authentication bypass, enables port-based access control using the MAC address of the endpoint. So this MAB can be enabled or disabled based on the MAC address. For example, let's say if an unknown or an unauthorized MAC address connects to a switch, what's going to happen? He would not get access. But if an authorized MAC address maybe connects, I can have, uh, I can give him certain access. Obviously by default, uh, there is a built-in rule on ICE for MAB, which will basically, um, authentication would be successful for all endpoints. And obviously you would have to do some kind of profiling. Otherwise it would be a nightmare for you to configure authorization policies. So if you look at the slide, it says prior to MAB, the endpoint's identity is unknown and all traffic is blocked. The switch examines a single packet to learn and authenticate the source MAC address. So even if you're sending multiple frames, he, the switch would only accept one single, single packet or one single frame, takes the MAC address and discards all other frames, all other packets, and um, sends that request to ICE. After MAP succeeds, the endpoint is known and all traffic from that endpoint is allowed to go as per whatever access list you have defined. So after MAB, he gets access. So after authentication only, he gets access. Without authentication, absolutely no access. I mean, you can still define some kind of, some level of access, uh, maybe um, like a local access list you could define and maybe keep the authentication as open. So you could still define some kind of access list at that level, at the switch level, but mainly you would want to configure the eyes to send you um, all the permissions that you need for that device to connect to your infrastructure. At the same time, <clears throat> 
At the same time, if you look at um, the configuration wise, it is pretty straightforward. The, the difference between dot one X and Mab configuration is maybe just one command of difference. Everything else is pretty much common, whether you configure dot one X or Mab. So let's look at some of the MAB benefits that we have. So MAB offers the following benefits on a wired network. So basically provides you with visibility. So you basically know the MAC addresses of all the devices which are basically connected on your, in your infrastructure, in your organization. So it gives you a complete visibility because now you know all the MAC addresses, all the devices, all the endpoints, which are basically connected. <clears throat> um, Identity-based services. So it basically allows you to, to identify the endpoint and give him access <clears throat> based on the endpoint. So maybe I could send him, like I said, maybe I could send him like an access list or maybe I could, I could put him in a specific VLAN. <clears throat> so let's say if um, a user A connects to port number one and uh, once he's authenticated, maybe he gets a certain limit of access list or maybe he goes into a VLAN 10 or VLAN 20. But if, if a user B connects, he maybe goes to a different VLAN, he, goes to a di he gets a different set of access list he gets different permissions. So, so based on the identity, I can define the, the level of services that I can maybe give the endpoint. Access control at the edge. So MAB acts at layer two, allowing you to control network access at the access edge. So basically ICE is going to send you an access list and that is applied at the switch level. So let's say if I deny ICMP from ICE, ICE sends a DACL to the switch and the switch is going to apply that access list for the endpoint locally because it has inherited that from ICE after authentication and uh, the packet gets dropped right at the switch. So access control at the edge and fallback or standalone authentication. So let's say if for some reason, maybe 802.1x does not really work, or maybe there's some configuration issue, or maybe your device does not really support .1x, you could always fall back to MAP. So MAP can always be like a backup for authentication in case if you .1x does not work. Obviously, you don't want to use MAP. Um, you kind of want to always use uh, 802.1x. You should prefer that, but for some reason, if your device does not support, then yeah, you could use MAP as a backup. And then obviously device authentication. So MAP can be used to authenticate devices that are not capable of uh, IEEE .1x or that do not have a user. Like I said, an old printer or a fax machine. These are the basic benefits of MAB. There are limitations of MAB also. So the first limitation is that, <clears throat> that the MAC database. So as a prerequisite for MAB, you must have a pre-existing database of MAC addresses of the devices that are basically allowed on the network. Like I said earlier that ICE by default has like a built-in rule for MAB, which basically allows any device, any endpoint to connect. Eventually you would probably want to remove that and have your list of endpoints. So it kind of becomes like a tedious task to gather all the information and uh, you must have the database of all the MAC addresses. Otherwise you're just basically allowing everyone. So that kind of becomes like a challenge the second disadvantage of using MAB is delay. So when used as a fallback mechanism for .1x, MAB waits for 802.1x to fail or timeout. So it's not that MAB would directly happen. Because MAB is a fallback, if it would basically do .1x first, it should timeout or fail, and then only it would go to MAB. 
So there are workarounds for that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there is a certain amount of delay which can cause a delay for you to log into your network. And again, there is no user authentication. It's just a MAC address. Now, you know, MAB is not recommended. Again, I would not say that maybe you use MAB as a backup also because there is a big security kind of threat because <clears throat> think about it. MAB uses what? Just the MAC address. It's really easy to spoof a MAC address. So all I have to do is spoof the MAC address and I would get access to the network. So because there is no user authentication, there's no username password. So it's just MAC address. So as long as the right, if I know your MAC address and if I spoof that and then I connect to the port, the switch would probably give me access. Obviously there are ways to prevent that, but just in general, if you're not careful, then yes, that could be the problem. And then the strength of authentication, uh, unlike .1x, MAB is not a strong authentication method. And like I said, your MAC address can be spoofed. So here is the high level MAB sequence uh, of uh, the order of sequence, basically. So here I have an endpoint, I have a switch, and I have a radius server or a TACAC server, basically ICE. So as soon as the endpoint connects, what's going to happen? Let's say I plug in a device, an endpoint to a switch on port number one. The switch is going to send me an EAP over LAN, basically an EAP request to, for your identity. Now, obviously I don't support username password, so that's going to force the, the endpoint to respond back with something. Now, whatever comes back, it's the, the first packet is taken by the switch and the, the source MAC address is learned. All the remaining packets are basically dropped. So once the switch gets to know the MAC address, the switch sends an access request to ICE. Obviously ICE has to be reachable, uh, the switch has to be a client of ICE. All that has to be pre-configured because again, if switch cannot reach the ICE, then obviously uh, you would not get access. So the switch sends an access request which contains the MAC address saying, hey, I have an endpoint with this MAC address. Who wants to connect to my device on my port number one? ICE would first check, are you my client? So if the switch is a client of ICE, ICE has to respond back. If the switch is not a client of ICE, ICE is not going to respond back. He would not even respond back. He would just silently drop the frame. So assumingly we have configured the switch to be a client of ICE. So once, once ICE gets the request, he checks his authentication policy. It goes through the um, authorization policy. It looks at the endpoint. Does it match some rule? And if it does, it sends, it gives him the authorization profile and assigns him or maybe sends him an access accept message, uh, which may contain an access list, uh, which may contain uh, maybe uh, a VLAN. So, so all that information really comes back from ICE in the access accept. Okay, so this is the high level map sequence where how the communication is really happening uh, behind the scenes. We would in fact look at this when we actually configure uh, map and dot one X on our switches and our endpoints. So that was map. Like I said earlier, map and dot one X, they both are pretty much the same thing. The only difference is that obviously dot one X is more secure. It is username password based versus map is just a Mac address, but they both do port based authentication. So <clears throat> if you look at dot one X, excuse me, it is basically something that you always want. You want port based authentication and you want 
to do it based on username passwords because it's more secure and um, I could do a lot more with, uh, with, with dot one X because I can assign VLANs. I can assign access lists. I can assign security group tags, um, maybe have, um, the ice connecting using PX grid, maybe connecting to a firewall like an FTD or maybe a web security appliance and give him certain permissions based on the username and password. So as long as a user X logs in, only then he gets access to a certain categories of websites. So I can define all of that with double X. So it really makes sense to to go for dot one x and not mab mab is something that you should do if you cannot avoid it like an endpoint that really does not support dot one x so put another way firewall helps protect attacks for originating from the outside and dot one x helps protect attacks originating from within the network <clears throat> in fact you'll be surprised that 70 to 80 percent of uh, I wouldn't say attacks, but issues happen from within the organization. It's not that employee is genuinely trying to attack your own organization. It's something like, it could be anything. You just connect a thumb drive or you, you connect, maybe you connect a, a wireless LAN or a wireless access point. And because of that, some machines connect and the network gets compromised. So, 70% of, of threats normally happen from within the organization, knowingly or unknowingly. That's where dot one X comes in. It is mainly used to protect your network from within the organization. Obviously you could still protect from outside, maybe any connect. So you could still do that, but mainly for the LAN. So when you plug your laptop into a LAN on a network with dot one X, the device must prove to the authentication server that it's allowed to connect. The authentication server communicates with your device using um, extensible authentication protocol over LAN, which is e -power LAN, and ask for credentials. All other forms of traffic going from your device or to your device is basically blocked till you're authenticated. Once you're authenticated, you have access as per uh, whatever access list you've configured. So this is before, before authentication. So everything is dropped. DHCP request is dropped. HTTP request is dropped. FTP is dropped. ICMP is dropped everything is basically going to be dropped. Again, like I said, unless you maybe create an access list and apply that to your port and then configure authentication open, which kind of gives you some level of access before you get authenticated. So for example, let's say if you want an IP address, like a DHCP server, from a DHCP server. So maybe I can give him access, to give him an IP before authentication. And once he's authenticated, he gets more access. So I could define that, but by default, everything is dropped except e -power LAN. That is not dropped. So that is allowed to go through because again, uh, um, like I said earlier in dot one X, the switch is going to ask you for credentials and you need to provide those credentials to me, the switch. And then I would take that and send that to ICE for authentication. So there are three terms you need to really know for dot one X. First is the supplicant. So you cannot do dot one X without a supplicant. So like I said, supplicant could be windows built in supplicant. So windows machine has a built in supplicant, or let's say if you don't have that, you could use any connect any connect as a supplicant. So if you install any connect on your machine, you could authenticate uh, yourself through dot one X. The second term that you need to understand is authentication server. Authentication server is your device that processes the authentication request, which is like radius or attack server. 
from a product perspective, it's eyes. And then we have the authenticator. Authenticator is the middle device or the device in the center between the endpoint and the authentication server, basically your switch. So endpoint does not really directly communicate with eyes. Endpoint is communicating with the authenticator, which is the switch. The switch communicates with the authentication server. <clears throat> so how does the whole process of dot one X really work? Let me quickly show you that. So the first thing, the authentication server, which is ice does when the device tries to connect to the network is it sends an encrypted digital certificate and its certificate and its security key over EAP over LAN saying, trust me, I am the authentication server in charge of this network. The device takes the certificate and validates it using a public key from a trusted certificate authority. Again, you can eliminate this process. So there's an option available in any connect also or in uh, the Windows supplicate also that I can, I can deselect that do not validate the certificate. Again, that's not recommended, again, from a security perspective, but let's say a lab environment, you could probably get away with disabling the validation check. Now, once the device trusts the authentication server and it knows who that is, the, a secure channel is created and then the e process starts and the communication basically starts with uh, between the switch and the endpoint for getting the username password. Obviously there are several methods for obtaining that username password. So we could use peep to get the username password. We could use a digital certificate for authentication, which is EPTLS, or we could use um, uh, EPTLS uh, or EP TTLS, which is either a username password or a digital certificate. So many ways of connecting the switch with the endpoint and then having them communicate um, using maybe PEEP. I think PEEP is enabled by default. So, so using PEEP, uh, in fact, I think EPLS is also enabled, but we can check that out. So yeah, I mean, we could do that. And uh, the authenticator is trusting the ICE because, uh, of, because of the connection that we would be making. That's the whole process. <clears throat> we'll in fact look at this process when we actually configure this. So what I'm going to do right now is I will quickly demonstrate uh, configuration for MAB and dot one X. So this is going to be my topology. It's a pretty straightforward topology, pretty small topology where I have one windows machine, which is connected not to the switch directly behind the IP phone and the phone connects to the switch on port number one slash zero slash nine or slash 18. <clears throat> the link between switch and router one, that is a layer three port. So I have a layer three connection. So for routing purposes, router one has been pre-configured as a DHCP server. So it's router one who is going to typically send the IP to the phone and also to the PC. <clears throat> and then we have ice that connects to router one. So this is going to be my topology. Okay, let me just quickly shut this and go back to, I think I have my diagram somewhere here. Let me take this here. All right, so I have my diagram here. I have my PC here and I have ice opened up here. So let's quickly go to the switch side, sir. So what we're gonna do actually is we will configure the switch side first. Now it's really important that 
you configure the switch properly, I mean, there's a reason why you should put as much information as you can, because the more information that switch sends to ICE about the endpoint, the better it is for ICE to profile you correctly. So again, it is important that you think about profiling also when you're actually doing dot one X or Mab, because imagine if I had thousand phones and I don't really profile them. I don't configure my switch correctly to send enough information to us. Ice, once the endpoint gets authenticated and maybe he gets the permission, ICE may not, or maybe he doesn't get the permission. He gets authenticated, but maybe it fails from the authorization perspective. What's going to happen is that if ICE is not able to profile you correctly as maybe a Cisco IP phone, there is a built-in rule on ICE, which is called a Cisco IP phone. So if I don't profile him, profile the phone correctly, what's going to happen? ICE would not be able to identify this as a Cisco IP phone. Maybe it identifies this as a Cisco device, but not as a Cisco IP phone. What's going to happen? I have thousands of phones. All the phones basically don't get profiled. They pass the authentication, but they fail at the authorization because it does not match my rule of Cisco IP phone. And I would have to individually go to every device and then change, either change their group or maybe go back to my switch and reconfigure with more information. Because at the end of the day, ICE is able to identify the endpoint based on certain criteria. Basically, think of it as like, like brownie points. So let's say if you are, uh, let's say if, if, if switch is sending DHCP information to ICE, there is a category for DHCP, which contains uh, DHCP class identifier, which contains Cisco IP phone. So RADIUS is able to detect that DHCP class identifier equals Cisco IP phone. So, but that information switch knows that has to be sent to ICE. Otherwise ICE would not know that this is a Cisco IP phone. And if I do send that information, ICE would assign some points, which is called as certainty points to that device. If it does match all the certainty points, which is required for sys matching Cisco IP phone, it gets profiled as Cisco IP phones. So with one rule, I could have thousands of phones just being able to connect to my infrastructure. We'll actually see that when we configure it. So I am going to start off with uh, the switch side configuration and I will configure a lot more than what is required for dot one X and Mav but I will explain each one of the commands, each command basically. So <clears throat> where is my device connected? So my PC connects to VLAN 82. My phone connects to VLAN, voice VLAN 28. I think it's, it's already pre-configured on my port, which I can show you one by zero by 18. It is pre-configured. I have switch port access VLAN 82, which means my untagged frames PC is going to send it and it's going to untag. It's an untagged traffic, which is going to go in, in VLAN 82. And the phone is going to tag itself with voice VLAN 28. That's already pre-configured. So the first thing that I will do before I do any configuration. I just want to show you something. Let's go to administration and go to deployment and click on your uh, eyes and go to profiling configuration. If you see by default eyes profiles based on these criteria, this is enabled by default. So it will, it will identify the endpoint from DHCP. I could use NetFlow also from DHCP span, from maybe HTTP, from radius, 
from SNMP query, from maybe Active Directory. So I have all this information here. So this information that I have here, this is what I need to send to ICE. Because if I want to profile my phone correctly, then I need to send him DHCP. Why DHCP? Because if I go back to my policy, let's say profiling, and let's search for Cisco IP phone. Cisco IP. Should be here. <coughs> Let's scroll down. It's kind of slow. Oh, okay, so I have this IP phone here. If I, this is a built-in profile. I can create this. If I look at the conditions here, so if the phone CDP matches, What's the condition? If I look at the condition here, it kind of says that, okay, if the CDP contains Cisco IP phone, then, or maybe if it contains SEP, then give him five points. So think of this points as like brownie points. It's just a pointer, like a certainty factor. And if, if LLDP matches, give him 20. If DHCP class identifier matches, give him 20. Then uh, CDP cash platform matches give him 20. If I add all of this, it comes to 165. So if my certainty factor is 165 and above, ICE would know that this is indeed a Cisco IP phone. But if it's less than 165, then he would not be able to classify him as a Cisco IP phone but maybe it classifies him as a Cisco device, which is in my parent policy. The parent policy obviously would be less than 165. So what we want is that we give enough information to ICE when we configure MAB and .1x so that ICE is able to identify the device correctly. It's a one-time configuration, which you should always do. So what I normally do is if I'm using NetFlow, then I would enable the checkbox in the deployment if I was using NetFlow. If I was not, then I don't need to enable that. I will be using DHCP, so I have this enabled. It is enabled by default. I will be using HTTP also, so I can enable that. So I can maybe do HTTP probes. Uh, Nmap, uh, SNMP query that's enabled by default. Let's just save this. So this is all default. What I'm going to do now is start configuring the switch so that switch sends all the information required to ICE. What's the first thing that we need? The first thing we need is to enable AAA new model because we need to define that, okay, I want to do dot one X and I want to authenticate my ports. Once he's authenticated, he gets the authorization to connect and maybe I could do account Accounting also, if I want. Accounting could be optional. So the first thing what I would do is obviously enable AAA new model, define AAA authentication. This would be not login because login is a device-based login. It's not a port-based login. So here I would do a dot one X and I could use a, like my own template. I could create an authentication list but we'll just use default. Default is automatically applied. So default group radius. So do authentication. Now, whether you're doing dot one X or you're doing MAB, you still enable dot one X only. You do, there's no option here to say MAB because as, if you remember, I told you earlier that MAB and dot one X, they're pretty much the same thing. Just the difference is username versus MAC address. So whether you're doing MAB, whether you're doing dot one X, you would enable this by saying triple authentication dot one X default is the template name and then group radius. Next, I have my authorization network default group radius. And lastly, I have my triple accounting dot one X 
default start stop group radius. So I have basically told the switch that for authentication, accounting, and for authorization, I, I, I basically enabled that. The next thing that I would do would be define my radius server. That okay, I, I am doing authentication, but who should I authenticate from? Who's my authentication server? That's where we define uh, radius, uh, my radius server. So this would be the radius server command. Now this is an old switch, so it's an old command. So normally you would, you could create like a radius server group, but this is, I believe it's an older version of the iOS. That's why it's giving me the old command. But the new command is just radius server and give a name and define the address for ice. So I would just say radius server host 172.16.3.101. This is the IP address of ICE. It has to be reachable. Authentication port. Now ICE supports the old authentication port as well as the new one. The old was 1645 and 1646 for authentication and, and accounting. The new ports as per the new RFC is 1812 and 1813. So if I don't define the auth port, it's okay because ICE would still support the older one also. By default, the switch sends the older one, but if you want to send the newer one, you can. So I, I would choose the new authentication port, so 1812, and accounting would be 1813, and then define my secret key. Let's keep this as Cisco. So now I have defined who my radius server or my authentication server is. I have defined that. The next thing that I should do is how do I, using which interface do I communicate with the radius server? So I believe, let's do a show IP route OSPF. So to communicate with 172.16, I don't really say, I have a default route. So I have a default route. It uses VLAN 143. So let's use that as a source. So you can use the loopback also as a source, but be careful, note down which interface you are using to communicate with ICE, because that IP address we need to assign on ICE when we make switch one as a client. So IP radius server source interface VLAN 143. So I am basically saying that uh, you would communicate with ICE using VLAN 143 as the source. Once I have defined that, the next thing that I will do is enable a few attributes. I mean, some of them are not mandatory, but some of them you really need. The first one that I would enable would be radius server attribute. There are lots of attributes of um, uh, in radius. In radius, uh, see the thing is that all communication between the authenticator, which is the switch, and ICE, that is that uses attributes. So it's not like when the switch is asking the endpoint, "Hey, give me the username." Let's say if he gives the username, um, let's say Nicole. He gives the username Nicole and um, the switch is not going to say, here is the username. He's, the switch is going to send attribute number one equals Nicole. So ICE knows that attribute number one equals username. So all communication uses attributes. So there are a few things, few attributes which is not enabled by default, which you should enable. Again, good practice. The first one is attribute number six, which is the service attribute. The service attribute is kind of important because that really tells ICE what, what is the endpoint doing? Is he doing a device-based login? So let's say if I was doing an SSH to a router or maybe an SSH to a switch, is he doing a device-based login? Is he doing MAB? Is he doing a port-based authentication? What am I actually doing? So, so using the service attribute 
the switch is going to tell eyes, hey, I have a device connected to my this port and he is doing a port based authentication. So I should enable the attribute number six, which is the service attribute. In fact, it actually calls out to you when you do a debug radius of the debug IP or maybe a debug radius authentication, I think. I don't really remember the command. I, my fingers remember the commands. So debug radius authentication, yeah. So it kind of happens to me sometimes that I don't remember, but my fingers remember the commands, but yeah. So when you do a debug radius authentication, you'll actually see that it actually calls out in the debug that really the service attribute or the uh, attribute number six is not enabled. So you should enable that. So radius server attribute number six and on for login authentication. So when the, when the endpoint is trying to log in at that time, send the attribute number six. The second thing that we should do, which is um, kind of important is attribute number eight, which is framed IP. So radius server attribute number eight, you should enable that because if I don't enable this, you know, what's going to happen? You know, when you look at the logs of ice, or even if you look at on the switch, show authentication session, fast ethernet, let's say one by zero by 18. If you look at that command, you see username, you see password and you see the IP address of the endpoint. So if I don't define, if I don't enable the framed IP attribute, switch would never send the IP address of the endpoint to ICE, which means ICE would not know your IP address of the endpoint. We should enable this because again, at the end of the day, from a security perspective, you would probably have some security group tags or uh, TrustSec implemented. Maybe you have a web security appliance or an FTD and you would have some kind of policies there based on, okay, if it's this IP or if it's this username, then do these things. Maybe give him access to just certain categories of website. So you should enable framed IP so that the switch can track the IP of the endpoint and send that information to ICE. So I radius server attribute number eight include in the access request. The next one I like to enable again from a production perspective, but you don't need to enable this in this lab which is radius server attribute number 25, which is the class attribute. This is usually used when you want to, uh, let's say you want to apply like a group policy. Maybe you haven't really defined a policy for a user and, but you have a group policy, maybe through active directory, you have a group policy and you want that. Okay. Once he logs in the group policy takes effect. So, you should enable this. Normally you would have this from production perspective, but again, in this lab, I don't really need it. I just have the habit of enabling 25 also. So send this in the access request include. Now, now you remember we did attribute number eight, which was framed IP. This is okay, but it's okay if the switch which is the authenticator, if he himself, a, he is the DHCP server. If the switch is the DHCP server, then he would know what IP he gave to the endpoint. He, he tracks that and sends that to ICE. But if switch one is not the DHCP server himself, in our case, switch one is not the DHCP server. Router one is the DHCP server. So how would switch know what IP the DHCP server assigned to the endpoint? You wouldn't really know. That's why you should do one more command, which is IP device tracking. So without this, the switch would not really be able to track the IP address of the endpoint. 
So there's no, there's no point of this attribute number eight if the switch himself does not know the endpoint's IP. Only if the switch knows the IP, he can send that information to ICE. Okay, that's one thing. The next thing that I should include in my configuration is AAA server um, radius dynamic author. Uh, again, this is not required if you're not doing change of authorization. So, however, I really like to do that because obviously you would be configuring ICE to send uh, configuration changes to the switch. So maybe you assign him a VLAN from ICE, you maybe assign him some configuration, change his access list. So if you want change of authorization, then you should enable dynamic author. So here the client of the switch would be ICE. So this would be ICE's IP 172.16.3.101. And the password would be Cisco. The next thing that I would do would be enable vendor specific attributes. Now there's a reason why I'm enabling vendor specific attributes. So if by chance you want to assign an access list from ICE, Let's say you want to push a DACL down to the, to the switch so that the endpoint, the port has a DACL attached for the endpoint or for the user. The problem is when he gets authenticated and he gets authorized, before ICE can send the configuration, before ICE can send the DACL down to the switch, ICE needs to know what kind of a device are you? So the authenticator, what device are you? Because see, different devices have different command line configuration. So the configuration could be different on different uh, vendors. So basically ICE is going to probe saying, hey, what vendor are you? So switch is gonna send back Cisco AV pair, which is I am a Cisco device. So now ICE knows, okay, the configuration for Cisco devices for access list looks like this, and he sends that access list. So without you enabling vendor specific attributes, access list would not come in. So your end, endpoint gets authenticated, gets authorized, but has no access. So even though he's authenticated, even though he's authorized by ICE, but he has no access. So that's going to be a problem when you have backels coming in. So you should enable vendor specific attributes. So that's going to be, the command will be radius server, vendor specific attributes, send during authentication, and radius server, vendor specific attributes, send during accounting. Okay. The next thing that I would do would be enable dot one X globally uh, for the switch. It is by default disabled. Now see, whatever configuration I'm doing right now, all of this is the same, whether you're doing map or you're doing dot one X. There's only one command difference if you're doing map or dot one X, which I will show you later. But all of these commands, they're pretty much the same. You don't do any changes. So I have to enable dot one X. That's done globally. So dot one X system art control. Now, the list of commands that I will give now before I enable DOP1X on the port and before enabling MAB on the port, whatever commands I give now, that will be from profiling perspective. Okay? Everything that I do now will be from profiling perspective because I want, I don't want to manually go to my eyes, go to my endpoint, and then. Um, I have thousands of IP phones. Maybe they are all different, uh, different uh, model numbers. I have maybe 8845. I have 7965. I have some old ones, 7962. So maybe I have some old phones 
and some newer phones. So what's going to happen? Let's say if I have thousand phones and there are hundred phones of each category, which basically means I have to go to my policy and create 10 separate uh, rules to match the condition of each of the categories of the phone. Instead of that, I could just profile correct correctly and all the phones gets categorized as Cisco IP phone with one rule and they get access. So saves, a lot of, saves basically a lot of time. So what I'm going to do is whatever commands I do now is going to be from profiling perspective. So the first thing what I'm going to do is create an access list. Why am I creating an access list? I'm going to create an access list to give him some permissions before he's authenticated. There's a reason why I'm doing that. You remember in the, on ICE, I showed you under profiling configuration, there was DHCP enabled by default, which means if I send DHCP information to ICE, ICE gets more information. And if you remember in the profiling of Cisco IP phone, there was a category there which said if the DHCP class identifier matches to Cisco IP phone, give him 20 points. So I need to send that information. So I'm going to create an access list which allows DHCP before authentication. Because if I don't do this, the minute I connect my port, DHCP request would get dropped. So it would never be sent twice. So those 20 points I would lose. I would not reach 165, which means I would not be categorized as Cisco IP phone. So I'm going to create an access list, which let's name this as block. Or uh, I don't know whatever name you want to give. Let's say block. And let's say permit UDP any any EQ 67, 68, 68. And then deny IP any any. So basically I'm denying everything. The only access he has before login is he gets an IP. That's the only thing. Where would I apply this access list? On my port where my phone and my PCs are. So on 18, IP access group block in. So now that port would not allow anything. So ping won't work, telnet won't work, ICMP won't work, or FTP won't work. The only thing that works is DHCP. So he can request for an IP. The next thing that I will do is you remember under profiling again there was cdp i will make sure cdp is enabled make sure cdp is enabled because again from cdp i can get information about the cdp cached platform which contains cisco ip phone how does cdp information go to ice through radius radius can detect uh, cdp attributes so i'm going to enable cdp uh, you remember we also enabled HTTP in profiling. So I'm going to allow HTTP probes. So I should at least enable HTTP server on my switch. Next thing is I would allow ICE to, to um, probe information through SNMP uh, from the switch. So SNMP server uh, community, let's put a, any community value. Let's name this as Cisco read only. So I'm basically creating a community read only community so that, and this information I would put on ice. So ice can send an SNMP request to switch to ask some information. The next thing that I would do would be THCP. Now, if you look at the diagram, my phone is going to send a DHCP request in this VLAN. This is VLAN 28 and PC is in VLAN 82. So they both would send like a broadcast saying, hey, I need an IP address, DHCP request. Would that request reach router one? No, because router one does not belong to the same VLAN. He belongs to a different network. 
So obviously, DHCP requests would never reach router one. So I need to configure help address on the switch. So what's going to happen with help address is that the switch is going to send a unicast to router one. Basically, switch becomes like um, like a proxy, so like a relay. DHCP relay. So PC or endpoint sends a DHCP request as a broadcast. The DHCP request is heard by the switch because he belongs to the same VLAN also. So switch hears that. The switch now takes that and sends a unicast to router one because switch one is now the relay. Router one replies back to with an IP address to switch and switch forwards that to the endpoint. So I need a helper address for my PC to get an IP address from the DHCP server and for my phone to get an IP address from the DHCP server. So that's going to be under my VLAN 82, which is my PC VLAN. I would say IP helper address, which is router one's IP 150.11.11.1, which is router one. Now, <clears throat> from profiling perspective, I would also put ICE's IP address. Now you may think, is ICE my DHCP server? No, but I'm still putting ICE's IP address here. There's a reason for that. So what's going to happen is when the DHCP request comes in from the endpoint, the switch, now the switch is going to send a unicast to router one and to ICE. ICE is not a DHCP server. So he would not give an IP address. Router one is a DHCP server. He would assign an IP address. However, ICE got the DHCP information about the endpoint. That's how he gets the, the information. I want to send DHCP information to, the, to ICE so that ICE can profile me correctly, the endpoint. That's why I'm putting ICE's IP address also. Let's do that for the voice VLAN also, which is 28. Okay, that's it. That's all you need from profiling perspective. Now, the next thing that I would do is just configure my ports, my port for authentication. So let's go to interface fast ethernet one by zero by 18. This is where my phone and my PC is connected. The first thing that I need on this port which is a mandatory requirement is I need the port to be an access port. Access VLAN, optional. You can assign a VLAN from ICE. You can, do, you can tell ICE to send uh, a configuration request to switch one to change his VLAN from maybe VLAN 10 to VLAN 82. So this is optional, but this is mandatory. Without the switch port mode access, um, dot one X can commands won't work. And uh, this is also mandatory because if I don't have port fast, then my, uh, my DHCP request would time out. So I kind of need the port fast also. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my port. Uh, fast Ethernet 1 by 0 by 18. And the first command that I would do is authentication port control. I have three options here. I have auto, I have forced authorized, and I have forced unauthorized. Uh, forced unauthorized basically means that all your dot one X or MAB request basically gets dropped the port would always be in unauthorized state. Forced authorized basically means that the port goes straight to authorized state. He's always going to be in authorized state. What we want is auto. <clears throat> auto basically means that the port is going to be in unauthorized state by default. Only after successful authentication, it goes to authorized state. So we want auto. 
The next command that I would do is authentication horse mode. I have four modes here. I have multi-auth, multi-domain, multi-host, single host. Um, single host basically means one PC. So on that port, there's only one PC connected. If it learns more than one MAC address, it would be a security violation. Multi-host means there are multiple PCs connected on that port. So let's say through a hub. So there are multiple PCs connected on that port. However, there should not be a voice VLAN, only access VLAN. So only PCs, no IP phones. Multi-domain means that you can have one PC and one IP phone. You cannot have multiple PCs, you cannot have multiple phones, one PC, one phone. And multi-auth means one phone, multiple PCs. So maybe behind the phone, I don't connect a PC. I connect like a hub and then I connect multiple PCs. So with multi-auth, I would, I would have one phone, multiple PCs. So because I have a phone connected to my switch, I could either use multi-auth or multi-domain, either one of them. I'm just gonna choose multi-auth. You could choose multi-domain also. I cannot choose multi-host because I have a phone. I cannot choose single host also. The next thing that I would do would be, uh, I would do, you remember we applied an access list. Everything is blocked, right? But we want that he gets whatever is permitted in the access list, he gets permission for that. By default, because of port control auto, everything is kind of denied by default. So what I'm going to say is authentication open, which basically means now without the access list, this is a very dangerous command actually. Without the access list, if I just do authentication open, you have full permission without authentication. So you don't really want authentication open without an access list. So now because I have authentication open and I have an access list, the only permission that he would have without being authorized or authenticated would be um, DHCP, nothing else. The next thing that I would do would be enable or define the order in which authentication should happen. So do you want to do map first? Do you want to do dot one X first? Obviously, uh, you would want to do dot one X, you don't want to do map. But if you want, you could do map first and then dot one X. That's really up to you. So authentication order would be map and then dot one X. Again, you would not want to do this. You would actually want to do dot one X first and then the map. Map is back up. However, if you want, you can, you can force dot one X first by maybe saying authentication priority reverse dot one X first and then map. What's going to happen with this configuration is that because the priority of dot one X is higher, it's first, even though map is, is first in the order, he would, he, if, if you are, dot one X compatible, which means if you have a supplicant. So if you are dot one X capable, he would do dot one X first for you. And if you are not, he would do map for you based on the order. So that this kind of helps you in both the ways. It's kind of um, both the sides. So if you have a supplicant, yeah, he'll do dot one X for you first because of priority. But if you don't, that he would do map for you first because of order. And then the last thing, the last two commands that we need is just enabling map and enabling dot one X. So you see all the commands that I did till here, they are common for map or dot one X. They're basically common.
You don't need anything else. The only command that I need now is if I want to enable map, I just give the command map. If I want to enable dot one X, I say dot one X PAE authenticator. That's all I need. I will not do this right now. I will first configure ice now before I enable map and dot one X. So let's go to ice. What's the first thing that we need on ice? What's the first thing we need? We need the switch to be a client because if switch is not a client of ice, what's going to happen? Ice is going to silently drop the traffic, drop the request, drop the access request. So there's one more thing that I want to see, um, which is there's one more thing that I should do, which again is only from perspective of lab environment, not in production. I'm going to go to um, administration settings, go to protocols, go to radius. And in radius, I would disable this checkbox. The reason I'm disabling this is because the minute I go and enable map on my switch and enable dot one X on my switch. The switch is going to, is going to go crazy. He's going to keep trying sending requests to ice, but ice is going to drop the request because I haven't configured ice yet. And if, if the number of requests is like 15 times in maybe like three or five minutes, which is as per this, which is five minutes, ice is going to block that device for 60 minutes, which means I would not be able to show you in this webinar because I have to wait for 60 minutes. So I'm just gonna temporarily disable this option. You should not do this in production. Again, this is just a protection uh, from rogue devices who constantly send requests. So I'm just temporarily disabling this. Let me save this. And I will go to the switch now and I will enable map. I will enable dot one X also. You'll see that it fails. Let's go to, let's enable map first and enable dot one X PAE authenticator. The minute I do this, my switch will start sending map request to ice. What is the ice going to do? Drop the request. Let's go and check that. I haven't really configured ice with anything at this point of time. So if I go to maybe operations, live logs, by the way, operations live log is a great tool to troubleshoot something that you should use a lot in the lab exam. So if I look back at this detailed report for this request that came in, What do I see? I received, ICE received a radius access request. Could not locate the network device or the AAA client. Radius request was dropped. Like I told you earlier, if switch is not a client of ICE, ICE is silently going to drop uh, the request. He would not even respond back to switch. And the best part about this log is that if you look at the resolution, it actually spells it out for you that what do you need to do to resolve this? You need to go to administration, network resources, network devices, and configure switch one as a network device. So that's what we would do. We would go to administration and network resources, network devices. And let's go and add switch one as a client. So switch one. Now you remember we gave on switch, we gave a command IP radius server source interface VLAN 143. There was a reason I gave that because we need to know what IP address is being used by switch one to communicate with ICE. So we are using VLAN 143. 
which is 155.1.143.250. I believe it's 250. 250. Let me just go and check that. Show run interface VLAN 143. It is 250. And let's go put the radius password as Cisco. You remember we enabled SNMP also for profiling. So I'll enable SNMP settings. Uh, default was 2C. The community string was Cisco. So let's submit. So now I have switch one as a client of uh, ICE. I have switched one as a client, which means ICE has to respond back. Let's go back and check. Can you see something happened earlier? Everything was failing, authentication failed, authorization failed. And now I somehow see some, um, uh, something nice. I see authentication successful. I believe this is my phone. Authentication successful. I believe this is my PC. Authorization succeeded. So if I do a show authentication session, I see both of them, MAB happened for them. There's a reason why MAB happened because my PC does not support dot one X right now. I have disabled any connect and I have not enabled Windows supplicant also. I have not done that. That's why MAB happened for both my phone and my PC. And if I do a show authentication session, fast ethernet one by zero by 18, should be maybe interface. You would see that, look at that username. The username is the MAC address. Like I said, in MAB, the username is the MAC address. And you remember we gave the command IP device tracking and we gave, we enabled the attribute number eight for framed IP. The IP address is also there. So my PC received an IP from DHCP before authentication. That IP address was tracked by the switch and sent to ICE. So this was my PC. If I scroll down, this is my voice VLAN for my phone. Phone got an access list also. It received an access list also. Now you know why this worked? Because my phone got profiled automatically. Let me show you that. I didn't do anything on ICE. All I did was I made switch one a client. I didn't configure ICE at all. Just made switch one a client. Because of my configuration of the switch, the switch sent so much information to ICE about the endpoint that ICE was able to identify that this phone is not just a Cisco device, it is a Cisco IP phone. And um, we can check that here under uh, context visibility endpoints. If I look back at my phone, which is here, let's click on that, go to attributes, look at the, so the, it was Cisco IP phone, the group. I didn't give this, it happened automatically. And look at the amount of information that my switch sent to ICE. So it sent all of this information. And um, CDP information, because we said enable CDP run. DHCP class identifier, which contains IP phone. Then, so this was all my information. Look at my certainty factor. Let's go and check my certainty factor, 165. So my total number of points that ICE gave me, gave the endpoint was 165. Why? Because all the categories under the Cisco IP phone profile, I send that information to ICE. So I just gave him points for DHCP, I just gave him points for CDP, I just gave him points for maybe something else. And the total points was 165 or above. 
So based on that, ICE was able to identify the device as a Cisco IP phone. And how does the authentication process happen? When the request comes to ICE, if I go to policy sets, I believe this is ICE 2.4. I think so. It looks like 2.4, let me check. Yeah, it's 2.4. So if I go to policy, policy sets and look at default and go to authentication policy, there's a built-in MAB rule. So what's, which says what? If you are doing wired MAB or wireless MAB, then what should I do? If I look at the uh, basic action, look at internal endpoints and um, uh, look at internal endpoint, which is by default. And if the user is not found, which means if the endpoint is not found, let's say if it was a new IP phone, I connect a new IP phone. If the endpoint is not found, continue, which means authentication passes even though the, U, the endpoint does not exist. I don't know his endpoint. So authentication passes. It now moves on to authorization policy. Under authorization policy, I have a built-in rule, which I didn't create, which has a condition that if it is profiled as Cisco IP phone, if it is profiled as Cisco IP phone, which my endpoint did get profiled, then match this rule, it matches this rule, gives him the authorization profile, the permissions called Cisco IP phone, which contains access except voice VLAN and a DACL, permit IP and ENE. So, so you see, I didn't really have to do anything on ICE. All I had to do was, was basically create, uh, make switch one a client, and then profiling takes care of, care of that. Obviously for my PC, my PC was doing map right now. We don't want to do map for him. We want to do dot one X. So for dot one X, we obviously need a username password because the switch is going to ask the endpoint for a username password. So first of all, I'm going to go back to administration and create a username password. I could do through active directory, but we don't have that much time. So we would do, a local username password. So I'm going to go and create a group. Let's create a new user group, not endpoint, because I'm not doing MAB, I'm doing dot one X. So I need a username password, a user username and a user group. So let's create a user group called, um, let's name this Cisco employees. Is that spelled right? Yep. So I have one group called Cisco employees and let's create a username now. So go to identities and let's go to users and let's do add. Let's create a username. Um, let's just use any name. Uh, let's just use Nicole. Uh, let's give the password. I don't need an email. Let's give the password as CCNA, CCIE, CCNA, CCIE. And he belongs to the group Cisco employees, or she belongs to the group Cisco employees. So I have one user created. It's a local user, Nicole and she belongs to the group Cisco employees. The next thing what I'm going to do is create a condition, condition under policy sets. Let's go back to default authorization policy. See, my PC also got authenticated through MAB. You know why that happened? The authentication happened through the default MAB rule under authentication policy, but the authorization happened through this rule, basic authenticated access. This is enabled by default. 
something that you want to disable. It's a good thing to have when let's say you were freshly deploying eyes and you wanted to get all your endpoints authenticated. Yeah, it's good, but you should never keep this on. Never keep this always turned on. It is turned on by default. This, what does this mean? It basically means that if you're authenticated, you're always authorized, which means if you're an endpoint, you're always authorized except for Cisco IP phone, but all other devices, printers, PCs, they would all be authenticated here. So something that I want to disable. So now if I disable this and don't create another rule, let me show you that. Let me save this. I'm going to go back to my switch and let's do a clear authentication session. So my phone who was profiled will get authenticated and authorized, which happened here. My phone got authenticated and authorized. My PC MAB authentication would pass, authorization would fail because now it doesn't match that default rule. It matches the last rule, which is default, which is deny access. It matches that. So my PC would, MAB would not work. If you see for my PC, MAB started, authentication failed, and now .1x is starting, .1x also failed. So obviously that's a problem. So what I'm going to do now is I will go to my PC, I will use a Windows supplicant so that's done. Let's go to services and search for search for wired. Make sure wired is on automatic and it's it started. I've already done that. Okay, by default it's not. So when so the Windows supplicant is disabled by default. So if you want to enable that you have to go to wired service, make, turn this to automatic, it is by default disabled, and start the service. Once you do that, if you go back to your NIC card, go to properties, and let's say lab, go to properties, you would find this tab called authentication. This tab would not come if you had not enabled wired or a config. So go to authentication, enable dot one X, which I've already done. So enable dot one X, go to settings. You remember I told you that in the slide that there is a certificate validation, which you can disable. You should never do that. But in my case, I am, it is enabled by default. I am disabling it. So I'm not doing a certificate uh, validation. And then go to configure. Make sure you uncheck Windows username password because you will try to log in with the Windows username password. If you kind of had like a single sign on, then yes, you could do that. We don't have that. So I'm going to disable this, which I've already done. And then go to additional settings, enable this checkbox and select user authentication and go to replace credentials, put your username Nicole password as CCNA, CCIE, and say okay. So now my PC has a supplicant and the PC would provide the credentials to the switch and the switch would send that to ICE. He would be authenticated or she would be authenticated, but she would still not get access to the network because of authorization failed. Let me show you that. Let's do okay. Attempting to authenticate, it says kind of failed. Let's go back to eyes and check the logs. So if I check, Nicole tried to log in. If I look at the detailed report, what does it say? Access request was received. And if I scroll down all the way, I should kind of see authentication passed. Uh, let's check.
Yeah. Found the user, Nicole, in the database and authentication passed. So authentication part was okay. Nicole got authenticated. Does she have the permission to connect to the port? That's my authorization. It went to authorization and matched the default rule, which was deny access. So it got rejected as per the authorization profile because there was no rule here. Now let's say if I had profiled it correctly, all I would need is one line or one rule for all Windows machines and all my machines would get profiled. Otherwise I would have to create multiple categories for profiling. So what I'm going to do is go and create one uh, policy set and go and create one rule under authorization policy. Let's create one above this. And let's name this uh, Cisco employee dot one X. Okay. What's the condition going to be? The condition is going to be if the user belongs to the Cisco employees identity group and if they are doing dot one X. So whoever's in that employee group right now, I only have one user, which is Nicole. So I only have one. So, however, if I had multiple users in that, then all of them would be authenticated as per this rule. I don't, I don't need to create multiple rules. So all I need is one rule. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, let's create one condition. So click on this, let's go to identity group. And if the condition is identity group name equals, let's choose Cisco employees, which is here. So if I have Cisco employees, then I should, uh, I should give him access or give her access or give all the users access. But I, I, I don't want just Cisco employees as a condition, because if I put just this, what's going to happen? Whoever is in this group can, can access any device, can do anything, can do a device login also. What do I want? I want that whoever is in the group Cisco employees, they should be able to do dot one X login, port based login. So I would put another condition as an and statement, which says if it is, let's say wired, dot one X, I could do wireless also, drag it here. So, and just say use, that's it. So what I've done is I made one rule here, which you can see here, the condition says, if you belong to Cisco employees group and you are doing wired dot one X, only then this rule would match. What's the permission we want to give this device? Um, I could create my own rule here. So by saying, uh, just give permit access. The problem with permit access is that it just gives me access except. And um, the problem is that I have an access list applied on the switch, which denies everything except permitting DHCP. So I kind of need to create an authorization um, profile, which kind of gives me like a dackle. So maybe we can try that. So I'll just click on plus sign and say, create a new authorization uh, profile. Let's name this as Cisco employees, odds profile and give him, give them access except besides that, give them a, maybe a dackle. So I could just say a built-in DACL, which is permit all traffic right now. You can create your own DACL also. There's a built-in DACL or like an access list which says permit IP any, any. That's it. And 
I think that should be enough. If I want to give them a VLAN, I can put them in a VLAN also. Like, let's say put my PCs in VLAN 82 and save. So now I can go back here and select Cisco employees or Z profile and save. Once I've done this, Nicole would get access to the network. Let's check. Let's go back. It's exhausted already, so I have to kind of uh, kickstart the session again. So maybe I can go back to adapter settings and uh, disable and re-enable to re-kickstart the authentication process. Attempting to authenticate, identifying, and has access. If I look back at my switch, authentication successful, authorization succeeded. She was assigned VLAN 82 from, this, from ICE. And if I do a show access list, you would see that uh, the user was assigned this access list. If I do a show authentication session interface, fast ethernet one by zero by 18, Nicole, the username Nicole, whose IP is 155.1.82.1, authentication, authorization was success, authentication was success, access list was attached to the end user, MAB, uh, X was success, and VLAN was assigned. So you see, configuration wise, on the switch side, everything is the same, just one command difference, which is MAB uh, to enable MAB and for DAW1X, DAW1X PAE authenticator. So this is basically the basics that you really need to know for DAW1X and MAB. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this webinar. Uh, what I'm going to do is I will answer some of the questions that you have in the Q&A. So I have a question here which says, what if there are multiple endpoints on the switch port behind the VoIP phone? So if you have multiple endpoints or, or PCs, nothing changes. The only thing changes is going to be um, you, you change your authentication host mode, depending on what you need. So maybe you have multi-auth, which supports multiple PCs and one phone. You cannot have multiple phones, but you can have one phone and multiple PCs with uh, multi-auth. With multi-domain, you would have one PC, one phone. I see another question here that in, in MAB, device sends the first packet to switch, which can be a layer two, can be a layer three. Um, however, layer three device still not have IP address assigned because of MAB. I mean, maybe the PC had an IP address before, like a statically assigned IP address. It could be any packet. It cannot be DTP packets, it cannot be STP packets, it cannot be CDP packets or LLDP packets. Anything else is okay, but not CDP, not LLDP, not STP, not DTP. Besides that, anything else. I see another question. Instead of MAB, is it better to use switch port security or sticky. Um, they kind of different things, but yeah, I mean, you could use port security or um, on, the, on the port, but um, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you want to compare MAB with port security, yeah, you could do port security also, but eventually you want to move to DAW1X so that it's a user-based authentication.
And uh, I think some questions I've already answered. Uh, what version of ICE am I using? It was 2.4. Uh, what happens when the client needs an IP address to communicate with the LDAP server and dog one X is configured. Like I said, I had like a pre access list, the block one, which allowed him to kind of some permissions before authentication. So depending on what you want, you can put that in the access list. Uh, in profiling configuration in eyes as per Cisco recommendation, do not enable SNMP trap. Uh, why and can you explain that? So there's a reason why Cisco suggests, I mean, this was again from the older version of ICE because the CPU utilization used to go pretty high, but I believe with the newer one, it's not a problem. With the newer code, it's not a problem. Um, I see another question. Is there a way to see on the switch configuration, the attributes it is sending to eyes? Yes, you can see that. I can probably quickly show you that. So what you can do is just do a debug radius authentication and then just do a clear authentication session. You would see the list of attributes which your device is sending. So you see here, You'd see here, attribute number one is username. Attribute number two was password. Then we had framed IP. So you see everything here, framed IP, calling station. You basically see it with the debug uh, radius uh, authentication. It's a lot of information. You can probably take that in a notepad and analyze that. Then I see a question. Do we need to TFTP server IP address to allow IP phone? I believe if I understand your question, do we need to know the TFTP server IP address? Yes. So my um, call manager is already pre-configured for the phone to register. And my DHCP server, which is RADA1, is already configured if you see here, show run section IP DHCP, it's already pre-configured with uh, option 150, which points to the call manager's IP. Uh, in my case, router one himself is also a CME. So kind of he's registering the phone also. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed this webinar. Uh, some of the questions I, I believe um, Brittany would send it to me via email and I can answer that back to you via email. I hope you guys enjoyed the webinar and I would see you in my next one.